Good day students, welcome to General Science 101. I'm your professor. We are going to be discussing what we discussed over the last few lessons, which is we looked at different aspects of heat, thermometry. We, in the last lesson, we looked at thermal expansion. We looked at the reasons for thermal expansion. And we said when energy is provided to a system, that energy basically goes into expanding the system. We looked at the expansions for solids, liquids, and gases. And however, we also looked at a particular type of expansion, which is known as anomalous expansion. Because normally we said, whenever we provide heat to an object, it expands. However, there are certain materials which in certain temperature ranges cause a contraction rather than an expansion, thus having the term anomalous expansion. The most vivid example was, of course, of water, which has an anomalous expansion range from around 10 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius when it's converted to ice. And again, it has a further anomalous expansion when it is converted from water to ice. It further expands rather than contracts. This has got a very vivid uh, ramification for what happens in nature. Because in nature, when water uh, turns into ice, in other words, become very cold, because ice expands, it has a lower density, it tends to float on water. That means the top of the water freezes first and the center of the water or the bottom part freezes later, allowing the marine life and the aquatic life to survive for a very long period of time unless it is a very, very harsh winter and the lake totally freezes. However, in oceans, the oceans do not freeze. Even in the Arctic, which is the largest ice body we have, you still find uh, aquatic life at the bottom of the ocean. In fact, the Americans and the Russians have been known to be using the, uh, the water gap between the ice and the ocean floor to do their uh, military maneuvers. In fact, the submarines routinely pass under that ice cap, as it is known, so that they can avoid detection from the satellites which are floating above. Now, what we're going to be doing today is discussing an uh, aspect of heat which allows us to understand how much energy is required to increase the temperature or how much energy we have to take out of the system in order to decrease the temperature by a specific amount. We are also going to be looking at the modes with which we can exchange heat. The modes, three modes, which we are going to be looking at are going to be known as conduction, convection, and radiation. We are also going to be looking at an aspect in which Heat is provided, but the temperature does not rise. There are certain states which are known as fixed points, and we are going to be looking at this hidden heat and where it goes, and we are going to try to explain it. And at the end of the lecture, we will do an overview of thermometry, wrapping up the three or, or four lessons which we have done with you on thermometry. Now, let us proceed. Now, when we say an object is at a certain temperature, at a certain temperature, it has a certain amount of heat available because it is hot or it is at that certain temperature. If you have two bodies, one is hot and one is cold, this hot body has a capacity to provide energy from a hotter level to a lower level. Hence, it is has the capability to do work for us. Now, how much energy does that object possess? In order to understand how much energy that object possesses, we use a terminology which is known as the heat capacity. A heat capacity is simply defined as the amount of energy required to increase or decrease the temperature of that substance by one degree Kelvin. So if this object was to at 250 degrees Kelvin, to make it 251 degrees Kelvin, the amount of energy we add to that system is going to be the heat capacity of that system. If that temperature of that object was 370 degrees Kelvin and we want to reduce it by one degree Kelvin, the amount of energy we take out of the system is again going to be the heat capacity. The amount of energy we take out of the system to make that system one degree cooler or one degree lower is what is the heat capacity. We should be able to differentiate what is the difference between heat capacity and specific heat capacity. Heat capacity basically is the amount of energy required to increase or decrease the uh, temperature of a body by one degree Kelvin. However, when you say specific heat capacity, then the mass of that object has to be one kilogram. So the specific heat capacity is basically defined as the amount of energy required to increase or decrease 
the temperature of an object by 1 degree Kelvin. So amount of energy fed to a system, you increase it by 1 degree Kelvin. Amount of energy taken out of a system, to in decrease the temperature of that body, which of course is 1 kilogram by 1 degree Kelvin, is the specific heat capacity. And the temperature here we are going to be, as like we stated, is 1 Kelvin. Now the amount of energy which we take out of a system or perhaps add to a system in order to determine the specific heat capacity, it, the amount quantity of heat depends upon the mass. The larger the mass, the more heat you have to provide. The smaller the mass, the lesser heat you have to provide. provide. So the change in amount of energy or the delta Q as we call it, the amount of energy required is proportional to the mass. The amount of energy which you have provided to a system will also depend upon the change in temperature. For example, if I have provided 10 joules of energy to a system and the temperature of that rises by 10 degrees, that would give us that one joule per degree Kelvin is what is required. So we can all simply state that the amount of energy required is also proportional to the change in temperature. The more energy we provide, the more the change in temperature, the less energy we provide, less the change in temperature. Combining the two proportionalities, we find that the change in temperature is directly proportional to the mass. It is also directly proportional to the change in temperature or replacing the proportionality with a constant, which is the specific heat capacity. We say that change in energy required plus or minus plus means you are adding energy to the system. Minus means you are taking energy out of the system has to be equal to the mass of the system multiplied by specific heat capacity multiplied by the change in temperature. Rearranging, it tells us that the specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required divided by the mass of the object and divided by the temperature range over which the temperature has increased. Now, if you look at this equation and we say that if the mass is one kilogram and change is one degree Kelvin, then the specific heat capacity C is equal to the amount of energy provided or amount of energy taken out of the system to change the temperature by one degree Kelvin of one kilogram mass, which is of course the definition of specific heat capacity. The unit of specific capacity in the SI system simply is that you replace the different values or the different components of that equation by their equivalent units. Delta Q of course is energy, therefore the unit should be joules. Mass is in kilograms, the change in temperature is in Kelvin, therefore the unit of specific heat capacity would be joules per kg per Kelvin. Now, continuing on to it, the relationship we find is delta Q is equal to mc delta T, where delta T is the change in temperature, C is the specific heat capacity, and delta Q, of course, the heat energy taken in or out of the system, m is the mass. Now, how do we determine the specific heat capacity? The mass can be measured on any balance, an electronic balance or ordinary normal laboratory balances which you have. Now, of course, the trend is to use electronic balances because they are more convenient and give you a reading which is easily readable. The change in temperature, you require a thermometer. A thermometer is a device which allows you to measure changes in temperature. Heat energy provided or taken out of a system, you can use a power meter, a joule meter, and you can also use other techniques to find the amount of energy provided as we are going to discuss as we continue along in this lecture. And the specific heat capacity, of course, can be calculated because there are four variables in this. You have the specific heat capacity as a variable. You have the amount of energy as a variable, the amount of mass as, in, as a variable, and the change in temperature as a variable. If you have three of the variables, you can calculate the fourth. In our cases, you have delta Q, you have M, you have delta T, and therefore, it's a very simple mathematical manipulation to find what the specific capacity is. Now, in this case, the mass can be, in case of a liquids, basically liquid require a container. Solid can be just a simple solid, but when you are measuring the specific heat capacity for liquid, do re remember that liquids cannot exist in free space. They will just flow out. You have to have a container which will contain that liquid so that you can make measurements. Now, if a liquid is in a container, then whenever you are measuring the specific heat capacity, you should also appreciate the fact that the container will also gain some heat. It should gain a temperature, and as a consequence, some energy is supplied to the container, 
Therefore, the mass of the liquid should be the total mass minus the mass of the container, of mass of the empty container. So it's a very simple process. First, you weigh the empty container, then add the liquid, take the weight again on an electronic balance, and that should give you the amount of mass of liquid specific heat capacity which you are measuring. To measure the temperature, basically what we have to do is dip a thermometer before the energy is supplied, and as the energy is supplied, the temperature is going to rise, and after a certain period of time, for a given period of time, we find how much energy has been given to the system or how much temperature has risen. Now the question is, how do you find how much energy has been provided to the system? Like I previously said, you can use a power meter or you can use the electrical method. Because in this course we have not dealt with the electrical method, therefore I will just uh, go through it and you can look it up in any textbook of physics that they define very clearly how you can do it. Normally what you do is you measure the current, you measure the voltage supplied, and you multiply it by the time taken for temperature to rise from one level to the other level, the one which we had just recorded, and that should give you the amount of energy because the amount of energy is also IV into T, where I is the current, V is the voltage, and T is the time it takes for the temperature to make that rise. This then allows us to the three pieces of information that we have the energy available, we have the change in temperature available, we have the mass of the liquid available. The only thing which we have to be careful about is that the container is also going to have that increase. And we should know the heat capacity of the container. Like I said, the heat capacity is basically the energy required to change the temperature of any body by one degree Kelvin. So the amount of energy required to change the temperature of that container from T1 to T2 is basically what we have to add to the system because when we are going to measure the specific capacity, the total energy minus the energy which is going to be used by the container to heat itself, the amount of energy which is left is the one which we are going to be using to calculate the specific heat capacity of the liquid. So basically substituting the values, that is the amount of energy which we are saying is the amount of energy, total amount of energy provided given by our calculations of electricity minus the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of the container should be equal to the specific heat capacity of the liquid divided by the mass of the liquid divided by the change in temperature as given by the relationship. What we are going to do now is just to give you an example so that you can look and see what exactly we are talking about. On your slide, we are, I've given you a question which says that 100 grams of water at 15 degrees Celsius is heated to a temperature of 65 Kelvin. If 21,000 joules of energy were provided, find the specific heat capacity of water. In this case, we have a mass of 100 grams, or we convert into kilograms, because kilograms is the unit we are looking at, it becomes 0.1 kilograms. The temperature change in temperature, the temperature rose from 15 degrees to 65 degrees, so T2 minus T1, that is because we are looking at the difference in temperature, it is 65 degrees minus 15 degrees. The rise in temperature is 50 Kelvin. C is the specific heat capacity, which we have to find out. Delta Q, you are already given that information, that 21,000 joules of energy has been provided to the system. Now, this system, which we are looking at, we already have taken into account the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of the container, therefore that is not figuring in this question. So very simply, C is equal to delta Q divided by C delta T. Putting in the values, we find that the specific capacity is 21,000 divided by 0.1, because 0.1 kilogram of the mass was there, divided by 50. So 21,000 divided by 0.150 gives you 4,200 joules per kg Kelvin, which is the specific heat capacity of that liquid. And as the question says, that is the specific heat capacity of water. Now, another technique which we can use is, which is known as the technique of method of mixtures. In a method of mixtures, what we do is we take a container which contains a liquid at a low temperature, perhaps the room temperature. We take another object which is at a higher temperature. We know the specific heat capacity of this solid, which we are going to add to the liquid. We can also have a liquid, the specific heat capacity of which we know. However, because we have to find the specific heat capacity of the liquid, therefore, we are going to be using a solid, 
the specific heat capacity of which we know. Now, this is at a hot body, it's hot, and we know from the law of conservation of energy or law of energy exchange that the hot object is going to lose energy, the cold object is going to gain energy. So, heat energy is, of course, going to be calculated at delta Q is equal to be mc delta theta as according to the formula. The mass is going to be measured on an electronic balance or you can use a beam balance for that matter. It doesn't really matter as long as the equipment you are going to be using to measure that specific the mass of that object is accurate enough. The change in temperature, we are going to use a liquid and glass thermometer for that. The specific heat capacity, of course, has to be calculated, where M1 is the mass of the hot body. M2 is the mass of the liquid minus the mass, total mass minus the mass of the container, giving us the mass of the liquid. The change in temperature, of course, now there are two changes in temperature. One, the cold body is going to go to and have a rise in temperature. Let us say that the final temperature was Tx and that is what we are looking at. So, the change in temperature for the cold body is going to be T1 minus Tx. Tx, of course, is a higher temperature. T1 is a lower temperature. In case of the hotter body, the temperature, of course, is going to fall down from T2 to Tx. So, there is going to be a fall in one temperature. There is going to be a rise in one temperature. So, the delta energy supplied, of course, is going to be the fall of the hot body which is M1 C1 delta T fall and M, the increase in temperature, of course, increase in energy or increase in temperature. We are not looking at increase in temperature, sorry. It is going to be the increase in energy is going to be M2 multiplied by C2 multiplied by the rise in temperature. Because the law of conservation of energy says that the heat energy, energy increase in energy has to be equal to the degrees of energy. One body loses energy, another body gains energy. So, we can convert this into an equation that the amount of heat gained by a colder body is equal to the amount of heat lost by a hot body or otherwise we can state it as heat gained is equal to heat lost or as our equations say that M2 C2 delta T which is T1 minus X or T2 Tx minus T2 should be equal to delta Q is equal to M1 C1 delta T fall. So, the amount of energy for falling and the amount of energy is going to be equal. In case of liquids, we also have to take into account the heat energy which is going to be increase or decrease of the container and we can always look into that. Now, this is going to be exemplified by the problem which is now on your slides. It simply says a calorimeter of mass 0.15 kilograms. So, we have a mass of a container which is known as a calorimeter. A calorimeter is a container which does not lose heat. So, it does not lose any heat to the surrounding. So, all the energy provided will go into increasing the temperature of the liquid. It will also go into increasing the temperature of the container. It has a heat capacity of 400 joules per kg. In other words, the heat capacity is given. We are not given the it's a heat capacity per Kelvin, but 400 joules per Kelvin is, so in other words, I have to provide 400 joules of heat per kg per Kelvin to the container. We are given the mass, so basically we can calculate this, we are given the specific heat capacity. In this case, it is 400 joules per Kelvin. It contains 0.1 kilogram of water. At 15 degrees Celsius, a metal piece of 0.25 kilograms is added to this. The metal piece was at 100 degrees Celsius. Very simply, you could have a metal piece in boiling water and then rapidly transfer it to this cold water. So, metal piece we know is at 100 degrees Celsius. It is transferred into the calorimeter. The mixture is stirred and after a certain time, a equilibrium temperature is attained. In other words, the temperature thermometer either rises or falls and you have a particular temperature which you can look at. And in this case, they say the recorded temperature was 40 degrees Celsius. The data which we have is that the mass of the calorimeter is 0.25 kg. We have the mass of the water in the calorimeter as 0.1 kg. We have a difference in temperature that the rise in temperature, it goes from 15 degrees to 40 degrees. 15 degrees to 65 degrees, so we have a rise in temperature. T1 is 15, 
T2 is Tx is 40, so you should have a rise in temperature of 25 degrees. For the hot body, the temperature falls from 100 degrees to 40 degrees, so you have a fall in temperature of 60 degrees. You have the mass of the object which we are putting in is 0.25 kilograms. You have the specific heat capacity of the metal which we have to find. We already know the specific heat capacity of the water which is 4200 degrees Kelvin and that is going to be what we are going to be using. So we have the equation which says heat gained is equal to heat lost. We put in the values of the in the equation and we find 0.25 into 400 into C, which is the specific heat capacity, we do, which we have to calculate two values. A, the value is of the container. Container has got a certain specific heat capacity. We said it's 400 joules per kg per Kelvin. So it is the, uh, we have the mass of the container, which was 0 0.25 into 400 into the rise in temperature, which was 15 degrees, plus the 4200 is the specific heat capacity of water multiplied the mass of water which was 0.1 multiplied by again the 25 degrees rise. When you do the two calculations, what you, what you find is 13,000 is equal to 15 specific heat capacity of the metal and hence dividing one by the other, we find the specific heat capacity of the metal is 867 joules per kg per Kelvin. This is a technique in which we are using two different objects. I have to find the specific heat capacity of the metal I know the specific heat capacity of the liquid by keeping the liquid at a lower temperature, metal at a higher temperature, transferring it and finding how much increase the liquid had in temperature. I can find, say, that because this temperature, this liquid gained X amount of energy, the metal has to lose the same X amount of energy. Because we know the amount of energy gained and the amount of energy lost is equal, that is what the law of conservation of energy tells us. We, are, we can simply equate the two and therefore find out what the specific heat capacity of this metal was because we knew the specific heat capacity of the liquid, we knew the mass of the liquid, so we know the amount of energy it has gained. We know the temperature of the uh, metal, we know the temperature lost by the metal and therefore we can find the temperature in which in our case was 867 joules per kg per Kelvin. What we are going to be doing today in, in fact, right now is look at the modes with which energy is transferred from one body to another body. Heat can only be transferred if there is a difference in temperature. That is what we have been discussing for so long, that unless two bodies which are different in temperature, heat cannot go from one object to the other object and we therefore cannot measure a transfer of energy. So for transfer of energy, the first thing we require is two objects which are at different temperature. The means by with which heat is being going to be transferred, there are three techniques. One is conduction, convection and radiation. We are going to be looking at three of them a little bit in detail. In conduction, the heat transfer is through contact. Two bodies come in contact because there is a difference in temperature. The hot body is going to lose energy. The cold body is going to gain energy. Because it requires a contact, we immediately say a medium is essential. You have to have something between the hot body and the cold body to transmit this heat and therefore a contact is required. Just like in thermometry, we said thermometer cannot measure the temperature of this body until you bring it in contact. Therefore, in conduction, the two objects cannot conduct from A to B unless they are in contact. And the process which is involved is, of course, the interaction of particles. So heat travels from the hot end towards the cold end and the transfer of heat is basically what does is that particles at the hot end, when they are heated, they vibrate and the vibration is transferred over from particle to particle to particle until it reaches the cold end. The other process which we are going to be looking at today is the process of convection. In convection, the particles actually move. It's not the vibration of the particles which is transferring the heat, it is the actual movement of the particles. Because again we have particles which are involved, a medium again is necessary. Convection normally takes place in fluids. Liquids, gases and plasma, of course, there is a lot of convection concurrence in there because uh, uh, when a liquid is heated, it expands. Because it is expanding, its density is decreasing, it becomes lighter, it rises and the cold liquid at the top 
because it is denser it sinks and therefore lighter liquid rises colder liquid sinks or lighter medium rises and colder medium sinks this is basically what is the process of convection convection process basically is a continuous process if you have a beaker like on your slide you have a beaker one end of which is on a hot plate it is being heated so you have a convection current which is being depicted here that the hot current is going upwards and the cold water is sinking because this is just what the process of convection tells us the third process is radiation now the radiation process involves electromagnetic radiation in this case because it is electromagnetic radiation we know electromagnetic radiation is a radiation which can travel in a vacuum which does not require a medium just like light reaches us from the sun it does not require a medium there is almost no medium between us and the sun it's a vacuum a very high vacuum at that and therefore we say when energy is being transmitted through electromagnetic waves it is being transmitted in a vacuum and it is being transmitted through radiation so these are the three processes which we are going to be looking at now the in detail we are going to be looking at the process of conduction and we are going to be looking at the factors which involve conduction now if you have a very small conductor and you have a large conductor more heat is going to pass through the larger conductor and less heat is passed going to the smaller conductor so we say that the heat energy transferred from point a to point b through a conductor would depend upon the cross sectional area of the conductor larger the area larger the current smaller the area smaller the current it will also depend upon the length of the conductor if you have a small conductor more energy will be passed because the hot end and the cold end will be very near each other if the hot end and the cold end are very far away from each other the rate at which the energy is going to be passed is going to be lesser just like we have thick glass it allows very little heat to pass through thinner glass will allow more heat to pass through therefore it will depend upon the length of the conductor it is also going to depend upon the temperature between the two ends if this is very hot and very cold a large amount of heat will pass if this is let's say about 20 degrees this is at 19 degrees there is only a difference of 1 degree a very little amount of energy is going to pass through so it also depends on the difference of temperature between the two ends and of course it also depends upon how long the two conductors remain in contact if we leave them overnight let's say 24 hours a lot of time of period has passed if a lot of energy would be transferred if it is just a momentarily contact only a few seconds then only a very little amount of energy will be transferred it again depends upon other factors but yes the amount of energy also depends upon the time the two conductors will remain in contact so we have said that the amount of energy transferred is proportional to the cross sectional area the larger the area more the energy is passed it is inversely proportional to the length because the longer the length less energy is passed smaller the length more energy is passed it is proportional to the difference in temperature the higher the temperature difference between the two ends the more the energy is passed and of course it is dependent upon the time the more the time of contact the more energy is passed and basically if we complete this into an equation we say the delta q is going to be equal to area multiplied by change in temperature multiplied by time and divided by the length this is a proportionality removing the proportionality to a constant we find delta q is equal to a constant which is k multiplied by area multiplied by change in temperature which is t2 minus t1 the hot end temperature at the hot end minus the temperature at the lower end multiplied by time because time of contact is there divided by the length of the conductor rearranging what we get is k has to be equal to delta q which is the energy multiplied by length divided by the change in temperature multiplied by the time in other words it gives us a value how to calculate k now let us suppose that the length is 1 meter the cross sectional area is 1 meter in other words we have a cube with the side of 1 meter and the we have the two hot end and the cold end at two surfaces of the cube at which are two opposite surfaces now if the difference in temperature is 1 kelvin cross sectional is 1 meter it tells us k has to be equal to the amount of energy taken out or provided from the hot end to the 
cold end. In other words, K is the property of material which tells us that the energy loss per second per square meter to a one meter conductor is the value of K and that is what it is. Let us put this to practical use. On your screen you have a slide which tells, gives you a numerical which says a glass window in the outer wall has a surface area of 4 meters squared. The temperature outside the room is 7 degrees Celsius where inside the room it is 22 degrees Celsius. We have to calculate the amount of heat energy loss every second if a 10 millimeter glass is used. K for glass of course is given there it is 0 0.8. The data which we have available is that the cross-sectional area of the glass is 4 meters squared. The thickness of glass is 10 millimeters that is 1 centimeter or 0.1 meter. We have the temperature difference which is 22 minus 7 is going to be 15 degrees. If we won't say 15 Celsius, we would say it's 15 Kelvin because we are looking at the Kelvin scale and degree Celsius, one degree change in Celsius is equal to 1 Kelvin. Substituting the values we find amount of energy lost is 0.8 into 4 into 15 into 1 divided by 10 into 10 to the minus 3 because we are looking at millimeters and 10 millimeters is equal to 10 to the minus 3 meters. So we get the amount of energy lost is going to be 4,800 joules per second, which is normally what we get in a window about that size and in a temperature range of that because if you are living in such a room and you have got a heater which is producing only one kilowatt, you're going to feel cold in that room you would require a larger heater to compensate for the amount of energy lost due to per this 15 degrees temperature difference. And which is normal because in normal, even in tropical countries, you have this much temperature difference between the inside of the room and the outside. So it should tell you that a 10 millimeter uh, pane of glass has a large any energy outflux. And sometimes we then try to insulate that by putting curtains inside because air is a bad conductor and therefore it allows us to retain heat energy inside the room. Now, what are the applications of the three processes? You have conduction, convection and radiation. Now, in conduction is a process which allows heat to pass from one, the hotter object to a colder object through touch. It allows us to cook food, for example. I place a pan on a fire the fire touches the bottom of the pan, heat is transmitted through the pan into the food which is inside the pan and it is cooked, it allows it to heat up, it allows it to be cooked. So conduction is a process in which the heat is now being transferred to, from the flame to the food. Now conduction is a property of a substance which has many applications. We use conductors in uh, different heating appliances, for example in electric iron, the electrical uh, filament which is inside the iron is heated, it transfers the heat through the iron which is metallic to the cloth and we get our ironing done. It is used in uh, for as insulators when we know the property of the material. Do remember an insulator is just a bad conductor, it is nothing, some, not something new. So materials which allow very little energy to pass through it are known as insulators and these insulators are basically uh, conductors which allow little energy and we use these insulators where we do not want energy to be lost whereas when we, in our far, cl cl far clothing and in different lagging, in, by lagging we mean that we are insulating some material so we do not want heat loss etc. So knowing about the process of conduction allows us to know what conductors, where we, where it, where, wherever it is expedient for us to lose heat we use a conductor like in car radiators and where it is expedient for us to not lose heat, we use bad conductors or insulators. The process of convection is basically in nature, it is used in weather systems, the hot air rises, cold air blows in and we have this system which allows us the land and the sea breezes. These land and sea breezes are of course as a result of convection processes. The domestic hot water supply system in which you have a geyser at one end and it is connected pipes giving you hot water in all of the rooms. If you have a complete system, this works through convection that 
hot air, hot water will rise, the cold water will sink, you have a circulatory process and therefore it is going to be using the, this gravity or the change in density or the change in temperature as we call it to make the water flow in the system. Room ventilators are another thing, another application of convection in which when it becomes very hot in summer, you open the ventilators, hot air rises, it flows out of the ventilators, allowing a current to flow through the room, making it more pleasant. In winters, of course, it is the reverse other way around. The application of radiation or what radiation is, of course, the natural application of radiation is that the heat of the sun, the light of the sun reaches us through radiation. We can scan a body through gamma ray radiation or X-ray radiations. You go for X-rays, you go for application and X-rays pass through your body. X-rays are electromagnetic radiations. They pass through your bodies, go to a photographic film and the doctors can then diagnose if there is something wrong with you or not. Radioactive elements also emit radiation. The radiation which radioactive elements emit, of course, there are two particles emitted. There are alpha particles and beta particles. The gamma, part gamma radiation is, of course, the radiation which we are talking about, which is electromagnetic in nature. We now have looked at the three processes. We have not gone into much detail of convection and radiation because we did not need it for this course. What we are going to be looking at is a new concept which is known as latent heat. Latent heat is the amount of energy required to change the state of one kilogram of mass. Very simple statement, but what exactly does it mean? When we say a state of mass, one kg of mass, we are talking, of course, the state of matter. We said the state of matters are three or four. There are solid state, the liquid state, the gaseous state, and of course, the plasma state. So if you have a solid at its melting point, then the amount of energy required to change that solid into liquid. One kilogram of solid, if you have one kilogram solid at its melting point, and the amount of energy you provide, then of course that energy is going to be latent heat. We're going to be discussing it as we go along and see how this happens. The SI unit of latent heat, of course, is energy provided divided by mass, which is joules per kg. Latent heat of fusion is basically what is from solid to liquid. You have the latent heat of vaporization, which goes from liquid state to a gaseous state. You should appreciate the fact and in fact remember the temperature of a solid or a temperature of liquid which is boiling is not changing. In the latent heat of fusion, because it is from solid to liquid, we say that temperature of will, solid will not rise or will remain constant until all the solid is converted into a liquid state and that is known as latent heat and we are going to be now understanding what a latent heat is. Let us say we take ice out of a refrigerator and measure the temperature, it is minus 10 degrees Celsius. We place it in a container and start providing heat at a constant rate. We add a thermometer to it. The thermometer, of course, at the initial time will record a temperature of minus 10 degrees Celsius because that is what we said was the temperature when we took that ice. As the heat is continually going to be provided, the temperature of that ice is going to rise. It continues rising until it reaches a temperature of zero degrees Celsius when it suddenly stops to rise even though a heat is continuing to be added. Continually add heat, uh, we find that the temperature stops rising for an appreciable amount of time. Now, where has this energy gone? We are providing energy but the temperature is not rising. Where is that energy going? Because we said whenever energy is provided into a system, it either has to do work or either its energy has to rise. Its internal energy has to rise, the temperature has to rise, but in this case, the temperature is not rising. What is the answer to this? The amount of energy which we are adding to the ice is going into breaking the ice bonds. It is converting ice into a liquid. And because the ice and liquid are in contact with each other, Therefore, the temperature of the liquid tries to rise above zero degrees. There is ice there which is going to take away that amount of energy. That is why until all the ice is melted, the temperature is not going to rise. That is why we have an appreciable amount of time in which we, when we provide, we are continuing providing energy, but the temperature is not rising. It remains at zero degrees Celsius for an appreciable amount of time. If you look at the graphical representation which is now on your screens, you will see that as you continue 
providing energy at a constant rate. The temperature will rise from minus 10 to 0 degrees, then remain steady for something like on this scale you have got from 25 to something like 50. So in other words, for 30 seconds, 25 to 30 seconds, it does not register any rise. The temperature remains at 0 degrees Celsius. This temperature remaining tells us that during this period, ice has converted to water and the amount of energy which we have provided is known as a latent heat of fusion. Why latent? Latent means hidden. Hidden, why? Because the energy has been provided, but apparently this energy does not register a rise in temperature. We have just said the reason for the non-rise in temperature is that the energy is going into breaking the bonds of the ice or converting ice into water. The latent heat of fusion of ice is 336,000 joules per kg or 3.36 into 10 to the 5 joules. This is a value which is available in textbooks and we can always look theirs up. Now if we continue to heat that water, remember ice has been converted into water which is 0 degrees centigrade and after a certain time the temperature again started to rise which told us the fact that ice had now been converted into water. Now if we continue providing energy, the temperature will continue rising until it reaches a temperature of about 100 degrees Celsius. When it reaches a, the temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, it again stops rising. In fact, some of the liquid starts converting into steam and water starts boiling, but the temperature refuses to rise even though energy is still being provided at a constant rate. Again, the question is, where is the heat going? Because we are providing en energy, the temperature is at 100 degrees Celsius, water is boiling, but the temperature is refusing to, to rise. Again, the answer is the same. In this case, the molecules of water are breaking away from the water and being converted into steam. So the breakaway from liquid to a gaseous state is at the boiling point, is where the energy is going. Energy is going to breaking the bonds. And until all the liquid evaporates, the temperature of the steam will not rise. And this change or this amount of energy required to change water into steam is known as the latent heat of vaporization. And that is what the explanation is. So latent heat of vaporization is simply the amount of energy required to change one kilogram of a liquid into its gaseous state with, at its boiling point. Do you remember that during the conversion, the temperature is not going to rise. And just like the latent heat of fusion, the units for latent heat of vaporization are also the same. These are joules per kilogram. But because the, in the joules, the vaporization requires a larger amount of work, gas is expanding a larger amount. Therefore, the latent heat of vaporization is, of course, going to be larger than this. When we looked at the thermometry in temperature, we said there are two fixed points. There is 0 degrees and 100 degrees. Why, are, why were these taken as fixed points? Because they are very easy to maintain. Because until all ice is converted into water, the temperature is not going to rise. Until all water is converted to ice, the temperature is not going to fall. For, so for an appreciable amount of time, the temperature is going to remain 0 degrees Celsius. And therefore, it is very easy to identify a fixed point point. In case of later heat, heat of vaporization, because the energy is going to be very large, it is 2.626 into 10 to the 6 Kelvin. So it is about 10 times, at least 10 times more than the later heat of vaporization, which is of the fifth order of magnitude. This is the sixth order of magnitude. Between the uh, boiling point and the freezing point, can liquid be converted into vapor. Yes, it can be, provided certain latent heat is available. But remember, liquids, the molecules can move. Because the molecules can move in a liquid, they have kinetic energy. Different molecules can collide and knock some molecules out. However, in order to be knocked out, you have to have sufficient energy, which is equivalent to the latent heat of evaporation and which is there. Therefore, we have evaporation which can take place at any temperature in a liquid. And the rate at which evaporation will take place will depend on many factors. For example, if I have a container with a very small opening, because the surface area is very small, very small little liquid can evaporate from that. 
Therefore, one of the factors which are going to affect evaporation is the area, surface area of the liquid. The second factor which is going to affect evaporation is the difference in temperature. At higher temperatures, it, evaporation takes place at a faster rate. At lower temperatures, evaporation takes place at a lower rate. The, the people who use, uh, who wash their clothes are familiar with this phenomena. Clothes dryer dry earlier in summer, but they take a long time to dry out in winter because evaporation is at a lower rate. Solids also convert into a vapor state. And of course, we have a complete process in chemistry, which is known as sublimation. Sublimation is a process in which a solid will convert right into a vapor state without having a liquid state. Carbon dioxide is one very vivid example. If you have solid carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide will convert it directly into a gaseous state without having a liquid state. And so we say carbon dioxide sublimes. Other chemicals, volatile chemicals like naphthalene, go directly from the solid state into a vapor state without having a liquid state, even though you can have liquid naphthalene in certain conditions. Do remember that, like I said, evaporation can take place at different temperatures. However, liquids will boil only at fixed temperatures. That is why we take a fixed point at 100 degrees Celsius as the steam point or the boiling point of liquid. And that is boiling point of water is 100 degrees centigrade. So boiling can take place only at fixed temperatures, which are the boiling points. Now, like I've stated that Evaporation can take place at all temperatures, however, boiling can take place only at a fixed temperature, which is the boiling point. Over the last three or four lectures, what we have done is we have looked at heat and temperature. We have said heat is energy which a body possesses because it is at a certain temperature. Where temperature is a degree of hotness, if A is at 100 degrees Celsius, B is at 200 degrees Celsius, then B is hotter than A. However, there are quite a few factors on which the amount of energy depends. The energy depends upon the specific capacity, it depends upon the mass of the substance we are looking at, and it depends upon how, what is the rate at which the energy is going to be transferred out, what is the difference in temperature, and so on and so forth. We looked at the fact that when you provide energy to a system, it expands. Solids expands, liquid expands, and of course, gases can also expand. Solids will expand a certain amount, liquids expand by a larger amount, and gases will expand by even larger amount. You have a largest amount of expansion per amount of energy in a gas and a lesser amount of expansion in a solid. We use it in different applications. For example, in liquid and glass thermometers, glass is a solid which has a very low expansivity. It expands very less, and we have a liquid in it, which is normally mercury or alcohol, which, which expands quite large we force into a glass capillary, therefore expansion is linear. Using this fact, we devised a temperature. We said we have to have temperature as a device which may use the degree of hotness. So we have a physical property, which is the expansion of a liquid. We are using that physical property to measure a temperature. Now, in order to measure a temperature, we said we have to define a temperature scale. A temperature scale basically has two fixed points. One fixed point was zero degrees Celsius where we dip the thermometer in ice and water, uh, ice and water, of course, being the melting point of ice or the freezing point of water, has a fixed, fixed point. It remains there for a certain amount of time, even we, if we provide a certain amount of energy or we take a certain amount of energy, that temperature is maintained for a certain amount of time, and therefore it is very easy to keep the thermometer there for a long duration and identify what is the temperature at the fixed point, which is the uh, melting point of ice. And then, of course, we took the thermometer, put it in the in steam above a boiling container. Like we have said, boiling can take place only at one fixed temperature, which is the boiling point. So if you are putting the thermometer in steam, you have boiling water in, un, under it. The steam would, of course, necessarily be at 100 degrees Celsius. So we have marked a point 100 degrees Celsius. We have marked a point 0 degrees Celsius. We have our two fixed points, 0 and 100. You divide it into 100 equal divisions, and we have our thermometer. Then we looked at the temperature scales we have. We have a temperature scale of Fahrenheit. We had a temperature scale of Kelvin. 
we have the temperature scale of Celsius. We looked at their intercomparison. We said the fixed point, of course, which we'll be using was zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. In case of the Fahrenheit, it was 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. In case of Kelvin, it was 273 degrees Kelvin, 273 Kelvin and 373 degrees, 373 Kelvin. So the difference between 0 and 100 was 100, or between 32 and 212 in the Fahrenheit, it was 180. And in the case of Kelvin, between 273 and 373, it was in 100. And then we looked at the interconversion formulas. We further looked out into the specific capacity, the boiling and evaporation, and conduction and conve convection. This was the sum of the things which we did in the past three, four lessons. And this concludes our area of temperature and heat and thermometry. Thank you very much.